So thank you all for so much for coming. Uh, today we're going to be talking about multi-tier security in Wasm Cloud, from developer constraints to platform extensibility. So my name is Brooks Townsend. I'm a senior software engineer at Cosmonic, and I've been a maintainer of the Wasm Cloud project since it started in late 2019. It's been in the CNCF since 2021, uh, and just recently we hit incubating, which was a huge milestone for, for us as a project. I'm a Rustation, I'm a demo enthusiast. You can see me up there probably wearing the same t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, preparing to do more demos, so very excited about that. And uh, I'm a developer, and the reason why I call that out explicitly is because when I started my career, I was working at Capital One, and I was actually provisioning Kubernetes clusters for like our internal developer platform. So I've gone everywhere from like running QB ADM on an EC2 instance to writing the code that runs on that Kubernetes instance. And so I hope that it kind of gives some context between what I'm talking about when I talk about platform engineers and developers, because I've kind of been on both sides of that fence. So what we're gonna go through in the talk today, we're gonna to talk about open source security for platforms, the problem that we have. Uh, I'm gonna go through a little introduction on Wasm Cloud, a show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Wasm Cloud project? All right, well that's like, uh, you know, it's a good bit of the room, it's nice. Uh, how many of you have heard of WebAssembly before? Okay, so even more, great. So we got a great audience for this. We're gonna go through that introduction. It's not gonna take too long, and then we're just gonna jump into rapid fire demos back and forth with uh, talking about Wasm Cloud's multi-tier security model, and then the innovation that we had earlier this year in the Wasm Cloud secrets and the extensibility there. So you'll see everything happening. Uh, it should be, should be a lot of fun. So let's start out with the fun quote. 74% of code bases, uh, this was a, a, a study in 2024, contained high risk open source vulnerabilities. Not like a vulnerability, like that would be bad, high risk open source vulnerabilities. And this really puts a high burden on the developer who's deploying applications, whether it's on their own or internal uh, to a big enterprise, to keep their code up to date. It, the, the idea of coming from open source vulnerabilities means that these are libraries you're importing in order for your application to work, but it's not actually your code. So these high risk vulnerabilities are happening as a part of, uh, or you're taking on the burden of maintaining these vulnerabilities as a part of your application. And this is largely because the platform engineering model today has a problem. When developers build their applications, they tightly couple their application code, their business logic, their functional logic, or their features with open source libraries and vulnerable boilerplate, usually actually prescribed by their enterprise to actually start their project or this like golden list of libraries that is like cool to use from open source. Enterprises then integrate their applications into their uh, internal developer platform. You know, this is just the way that they do it. This is the way that we are deploying apps. And then platform engineers have to operate those on a variety of control planes. And this is exactly why we started the Wasm Cloud project out of Capital One five years ago. What we saw is that across the organization, we have a huge developer experience gap where every application team for each of their applications was not only writing their functional code, they were also bringing in their dependencies, application capabilities, and the operation or the information about how their app needs to run at runtime, building that into a container and then shipping the whole thing. And this, of course, creates a huge problem when it comes to updating. Uh, you have to maintain that application. And development teams are unhappy and spending a ton of their time on just making their app like continue to function. So the idea was, when we were looking at building Wasm Cloud, is fixing that problem by making sure that the application is just the app code. Sounds crazy, but it just might work. We look to abstract the dependencies, the capabilities that make an application actually work at runtime, and the runtime information as a part of the platform. And what that allows uh, companies and, and developers to do is the platform engineers can maintain the platform, and the developers can maintain their application code. They can rebuild and redeploy it if they wanna make a change to their own feature or add something, or maybe they wrote it wrong and they broke it, but they don't have to do that for their dependencies. 
And over the last three years as a CNCF project, even over the last six months, Wasm Cloud has changed a ton. So from that initial goal coming out of Capital One, uh, we chose WebAssembly as our unit of compute for the application. And that is because its unique status, uh, its unique features as a deny by default platform agnostic binary. So we figured if we're already pulling the dependencies out, might as well not worry about uh, shipping the entire container too. And Wasm Cloud has unique benefits when it comes to being a WebAssembly native platform. The developers write business logic in a source language like Go, Rust, or TypeScript using a set of common APIs like database connectors, HTTP, distributed logging. This is all provisioned for the developer as a part of the platform. And what this enables is you shipping this little uh, reusable building block of code. And that single binary is what you deploy to production. Once you have finished building your application, you can actually compose them together with other reusable building blocks uh, that we call capabilities. And this interface-driven development model allows you to write your code in terms of a common abstraction like key value. And then at runtime, you can swap that implementation, whether it's locally, you know, just using in memory, you know, deploying to Redis when you're in production. And this capability-driven model not only uh, provides those to your WebAssembly applications, but it also is a part of the WebAssembly sandbox. So you can deny uh, the access to those capabilities at runtime. Now, Wasm Cloud, just like container uh, platforms need container native tools like Kubernetes, like an orchestrator or a scheduler or a higher level cloud platform to actually run and scale efficiently, WebAssembly is no different. So with Wasm Cloud, what we truly focus on is scaling WebAssembly components across a variety of infrastructure. It's just a binary, so you can run it on any cloud, any edge, even like on-prem or on your laptop. And the key piece that we do there is the distributed RPC between your applications. And we use the CNCF project NATS to get that done. So I don't know if you all have heard of NATS, but it creates this nice flattened topology network so your applications can talk to each other no matter where they're running. Now Wasm Cloud, of course, has a variety of features, but it speaks a little bit better for you to just look at what it looks like to build and target WebAssembly. And because it, it truly, I know it sounds like there's a whole lot going on, but really the difference between containerizing an application and componentizing an application is just the output uh, unit of compute. You start with Go code. If you were containerizing a Go application, and this, the process is the same for each language, you would you know, run a Docker build uh, that just runs a Go build, and you have a Go binary inside of your Go container, and then that's what you ship on, you know, in, into production. Componentizing an application, you actually use the same compiler tool chain. In this case, we actually use TinyGo, and I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that. But you compile your Go code to a Go WebAssembly component. So it's like your gooses and your gorches, you just change it to be the WebAssembly target. Uh, some of you get that. So uh, let me go ahead and show you what this looks like. Uh, we'll go over to my uh, code window. And what I actually, hey, get out of here. What I actually have is a little Go application. It's, it's just like kind of a simple HTTP microservice. So I've got a couple of, uh, couple of URLs, a couple of URIs that I'm handling here. If I go to slash, I just get this HTML page. You know, if I take a look at some of the code here, we're using like the net HTTP library from the Go standard library to just get some information about the user agent and, and then display like an HTML page. Pretty regular, pretty dumb uh, Go microservice. So if I do make run, what this actually does is runs a little Docker build. And then inside of that Docker container, we're running a Go build. And then we start it listening and exposing that localhost 8080 port, right? Everybody's kind of done this if you built a containerized application. So I'll go to localhost 8080. Here's my little Go server. Great. This is when I made the request. Woohoo. No, no claps? No claps for the... Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. All right, very, very much appreciate that. You know, we can go to slash hello, and we'll see this little tiny message in the top, you know, hello from Go. Woo, not that. And uh, this is my little server. So right, I built a containerized application in Go. Let's do it in WebAssembly. So I'm going to actually do make run Wasm. And what this does is this builds the WebAssembly component. We target the WASIP2 compile target. 
And then I have some information about what my WebAssembly component is going to do at runtime with the interfaces, which we'll talk a little bit more about. We just output that build to the WebAssembly binary, and then I serve on localhost 8080. You can think of WebAssembly kind of like a tiny virtual machine. So your component is the guest, and the runtime that we're using is actually a, a standard runtime that comes uh, out of the Bytecode Alliance. But all you really need to know, you know, I'll hit a, a refresh here. I can see my same Go server. I can go to slash hello, see hello from Go. That's it. That's, that's the difference when you're building to WebAssembly. And of course, there's a couple caveats there, um, but you're building to a component. And the caveats actually mean for a very strong security model. So the difference between this native Go binary and the WebAssembly component, first of all, it gets realized in size. My little HTTP microservice here is like two megabytes. Okay, 2.9, fine. Three megabytes, very small. Additionally, we can inspect this WebAssembly binary. No, you don't have to do that. All right, we can inspect this WebAssembly binary. And what we actually see is everything, oh, it's not actually, okay, okay, okay. Well, we can inspect this binary, and we can actually see everything that this component is going to do at runtime. And this is all possible because of the WebAssembly component model. So when you look at this, you can see a fine grain list of capabilities of everything that this app might do uh, when you run it. So you can see that I may make use of input, or like reading input from standard in, outputting to standard error. I may make outgoing HTTP requests. I may handle incoming HTTP requests. And really what you need to pay attention here is that this deny by default sandbox, this capability driven model, this is incredibly powerful. You can't do this with a container or even a binary. You can't ask it for everything that it's going to do at runtime by just looking at the artifact. And we'll keep coming back to this through the presentation, but as a, uh, as a, as a general conclusion, that is what you need to keep in mind as we go through talking about the different layers of security with WebAssembly. So I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, one difference when we ran this component versus running the Go uh, Docker container. When I send my localhost HTTP request, that when I'm running in Docker just goes and hits the port directly. My Go microservice is listening directly on that port. With WebAssembly, it actually doesn't have the ability to open up a local address to listen for HTTP requests on. When I run it using a WebAssembly runtime, that is the entity that spins up a local you know, TCP address, and then it will call the function handler for the HTTP uh, on the HTTP component. So big difference here is just that the component itself is not setting up that resource. Uh, so we can deny that if we like. So taking that away, WebAssembly is just a compile target. WebAssembly can be interpreted for runtime behavior at build time, which is incredibly powerful for a security model. And these capability-driven permissions are run in a deny-by-default sandbox uh, execution environment. Now, this sandbox is something that we work to, that we, that we have complete extensibility within the Wasm Cloud platform for. If we take a look at a list of what a component may do at runtime, we have an interface something like Wasm Cloud Postgres Query. And of course, this is a, an interface that we implement for Wasm Cloud, but it's actually satisfied by a plugin, a host plugin that we run uh, at runtime. So this custom capability model, it, do, it isn't just like this fine-grained list of system interfaces. You can provide your own implementation as well. And most of these are actually satisfied by the runtime itself. Uh, you don't have to worry about like setting up standard in, standard out, all those things. Okay, so now that you understand WebAssembly is a compile target and that we can inspect it for what it's going to do at runtime, let's see what we can do with this capability-driven model. So I'll go back and instead of actually running this in Docker or running this as a runtime, I think I stopped everything, I'm gonna actually run our Wash dev tool. So Wash is the Wasm Cloud shell. Uh, we love our puns here. What this is actually going to do is build my component and then do that same inspect step to see what it's going to do at runtime. And we'll actually provision a local platform so that this application can, can work and have its interfaces satisfied. So I'll go to localhost 8000 this time. Uh, and as soon as it's fully provisioned, we'll actually be able to see uh, that application uh, in, in the browser. So we'll just give it a second. But what I wanted to do is essentially go and uh, update one of my methods. So this hello method that we've provisioned. Oh, come on. All right. 
Uh, give me one second. We'll start this one over. Gotta love the, the demo right at the end of the day. What we're gonna do is we're gonna update this hello handler. So instead of, oh, I bet I know what it is. Oh, okay. Instead of just saying hello from Go at the end of the day, what we're actually going to do is change this to use a key value store. And uh, this is going to be the common abstraction for key value that we can use with WebAssembly, which is a, a WASI interface. So we're gonna open a bucket, um, and this is just any bucket. We're not saying whether this is Redis, or we're not saying if this is some other key value store. And then we're going to increment a value uh, at the hello uh, counter. So I'm just giving my, my app a second to start up. Aha, that is why. Here, just give me just a moment. This is the unique problem of doing your little dry runs before the, before the actual demo. Stand this back up, give it one more chance. So in doing this, what we'll go ahead and do is we'll uncomment this code. There's two interfaces here. One is store and one is atomics. With we'll the refresh, there's our endpoint. So instead of going to hello and seeing hello from go, We'll go ahead and hit save here. We're doing a local kind of hot reload development loop. So as soon as we see this, we'll actually import this interface. And then uh, if we actually inspect the binary, the WebAssembly binary, what our Wasm Cloud shell will detect is, hey, now we have a dependency on a key value store. So we'll hook that up automatically to the NATS key value store, which is part of what we already have provisioned for the Wasm Cloud infrastructure. You can see that every time I request now, now I'm upgrading or I'm, I'm incrementing a counter. So now I've added another capability to my platform, uh, which is great. Now, let's say we wanted to do something uh, different. So instead of using a key value store, we just wanted to do it with a file. And I actually have this already set up. So we have a hello file handler. And what it's going to do is read a file on disk from counter.txt. This actually does a really nice job of error handling. And what it's going to do is uh, create that file if it doesn't exist. Like, we're not going to fail out on that. I will go to slash hello file. You'll see they actually get a runtime error. And that's kind of strange. Like, this feels like something we should be able to do without a problem. Like, if I go over to another terminal window, and I do a Docker run. I'm going to run the same binary or the same, you know, microservice in Go. Yeah, uh, this should work pretty fine. Like loading this from a file. Why would it do that? And that's actually because of the deny by default security model. I didn't declare that I have a capability on reading a file from the file system, so it's actually denied at runtime picking something off of disk. It's the same model for networking capabilities, same model for uh, higher level capabilities like key value. Even generating a random number can be denied at runtime with the WebAssembly sandbox. So this was a, a further demonstration of what we can do with Wasm Cloud. And I think it's really important to note that uh, you know, as, we, as we look at the demo takeaways, this capability-driven permissions can be extended, but they are denied by default. You're going to fail if you try to use a capability that you're not allowed to at runtime. And the implications for this when you're running in a platform is you can't have a vulnerable open source library come in and start making outbound network requests without you knowing. You can deny that from starting entirely, and you can have it fail at runtime. And then with Wasm Cloud, this model of the pluggable capabilities, you can provide your own implementations. That's kind of what you should, uh, you should take away from, from that. And I know that we're talking about many different layers of platform security, and it's really just kind of like an onion, right? It smells really bad, and sometimes platform security makes you want to cry. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, there's a lot of layers to it. So when we're, when we're building a platform, it's not just this, this single binary that we're running. Um, and in order to abstract these dependencies and capabilities, we found ourselves in a situation with Wasm Cloud where it's like, well, I mean, are we going to be the Kubernetes for Wasm? Maybe. Are we going to write primitives to provision compute and storage and do observability and run ops? That's probably a little bit too much to take on. And so this extension model that we have with Wasm Cloud, the different platform layers, is really important for us in order to get uh, our job done, be the best uh, WebAssembly application platform, but integrate with existing tools. 
So we have a multi-tier pluggable security model. You know, the WebAssembly component as the unit of compute and the runtime as the standard battle-tested WASM time give us that nice, uh, that nice baseline. Then we have additional pluggable security with our capability providers and then our pluggable policy service and our secrets implementation. So just to give you an idea of one of these, simple request reply API using NATS, we have a policy engine that actually allows you to write your own custom policies for evaluating actions at runtime. So say I want to start a component and it has a, a capability that says, hey, uh, I'm going to make outbound network requests. You can actually write an OPA policy to say, hey, if this is present in the list of capabilities, then actually deny this from starting. And we would never want to build this into our platform because people like making HTTP requests. We want them to be able to have that. But when you're running as an organization, if you're deploying this as a platform uh, for yourself, you can actually deny that uh, on your own. And that's completely pluggable, very simple NATS API. Um, so we have like examples for OPA or maybe just a Go binary, all that fun stuff. Now we saw this work really well. And one of the most requested features for the Wasm Cloud platform after we launched 1.0 earlier this year was secrets. I need to have a first class primitive in our application for managing secrets. And Wasm Cloud being highly distributed, it's very important that we can retrieve those secrets that's encrypted at rest in whatever secrets backend you use, and then it's encrypted the entire, uh, the entire length of transit as you go across our API. So this is what it looks like to set up a secret in our ap application manifest. You set up a policy, so you say, hey, I'm gonna be pulling uh, secrets from Vault. And then you specify for a component, you know, this component's gonna be able to pull an API key. And when Wasm Cloud sends a request to the backend, here's how to locate that secret in the backend. So this is very extensible. We have an implementation for NAT's key value, which is like a distributed key value store, Hashcore Vault, and for slurping in Kubernetes secrets. And this also uses a pluggable API. So we have a, uh, a subject prefix for the secrets backend, and it actually only needs to support two operations. One, to get the public key of the server so that we can encrypt a payload with the target of the server that the backend can only decrypt. And then the get endpoint, which is where we'll send our encrypted requests and expect an encrypted response. And then it's gonna get a little like Charlie Day pointing over here, but I really wanna show you all how this actually works. We start a, a provider, a capability, a component uh, with a dependency on a secret. So we say, hey, we need to pull this secret and we're gonna pull it from a secrets backend and here's how to get it. So the first thing that Wasm Cloud does is we ask for that public key so that we can send an encrypted request. That, request, that public key comes back. We generate a request specific public private key pair so that this is resilient against replay attacks. And then we send an encrypted request for the secret with all of the context and metadata about the application that's actually requesting that. So the secrets backend, this is our plugin model, can actually make a decision if this entity or this principal should be able to pull the secret. And that may be a predetermined or a predefined vault policy that you have. It may be a loose mapping from identity to a secret, or it may be a, you know, it may be like an IAM policy if you're running in the cloud. So send that secret back, and then we can actually pass that secret to the application over standard in. Nothing is, uh, nothing is exposed over the wire, nothing sent in transit without being encrypted, and nothing is actually stored uh, without being encrypted as well. You know, security stuff. But this is a very powerful model, and I want to show you what it looks like. So we are going to get back into, get back into the demo. I have actually set up something uh, on this local platform that uh, is going to make a, a really cool use of secrets. So let me show you what that is. We have a, a couple more endpoints here uh, with an OAuth implementation. I'm not going to go all the way into uh, what what the the OAuth implementation does. It's just using the uh, the OAuth library from Google. But what is really interesting is the implementation here uh, in the component. So if I uh, uncomment some of this uh, library here, the uh, OAuth configuration. This is the really special part about our secrets, uh, our secrets interface. There's two parts. One is the store, so getting a secret reference, and then the other one is reveal. 
So when you first get the secret, this is actually an opaque reference. The secret is actually never loaded into the application's memory. So uh, just to show you that I'm pretty confident in that, I'm just gonna print the secret to standard error. Great, uh, if I mess this up, if we've messed up Wasm Cloud secrets, then you get to look at my uh, OAuth secret code, which is great. And then uh, just in time in order to create the OAuth configuration for this secret, uh, what we do is we are going to uh, reveal that and then create that config and send off the request and everything. So I am actually going to uh, skip a little step where we, where we run wash dev. I'm gonna run uh, wash up and configure Wasm Cloud whenever it has a secret request to send a request to uh, a backend with, with wasmcloud.secrets. So in another terminal window, I'm gonna set up one more thing. I'm gonna subscribe on the entire secrets protocol. So we're gonna actually take a look at all the messages that get sent over the wire. And then finally, I am going to deploy my application kind of just like I did before. So I have my manifest here. This is the declarative application that you saw before. I have a policy to be fetching secrets from the Nats KV secrets backend. And then I'm telling my, uh, I'm tell telling my application that it's gonna need a client ID and a client secret. So we're gonna do some OAuth stuff. Uh, real quick, what I'm gonna do is just launch the secrets uh, backend and then put those encrypted secrets in, in Nats KV. This is the full setup. But really what's important for you to know is that I'm just pulling those secrets out of this environment, uh, these two like environment files. You guys wanna, you wanna see them? What's in, no, 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 okay, never mind. So, okay, anyways, jokes aside, I gotta keep you all awake. We're gonna go to localhost 8000, is it 8080? No, 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 I didn't deploy my application. You have to do that. So we are going to, to build the component itself. This is going to go through kind of the whole, uh, this is just gonna do the tiny go build command under the hood. And then uh, we are going to do a wash app deploy with our, uh, with our YAML manifest. So that application should start up in just a couple of seconds. We are going to get that, okay, thanks Wi-Fi. We're gonna go back here and now we can actually visit my other secure endpoint. So I'll go to slash login, click on that, uh, go ahead and sign in here, nobody look. Uh, my two-factor auth doesn't actually work right now, which is really cool, and who has time to debug that before a conference talk, so we're signing in. And as soon as I go through that uh, approval request, we'll get redirected back, and then here's all that information about that OAuth uh, bit. Now, great, you've seen an OAuth implementation. It's done in WebAssembly, but just kind of using like the, the standard like Go OAuth libraries and the GitHub uh, bit there. What is really powerful about this, if I inspect my WebAssembly component, like I said earlier, we can actually see everything that this component's going to do at runtime. Included in this list of deny by default capabilities is the Wasm Cloud Secrets interface. So the one for store, which is this first bit uh, right here, a tiny window, this first bit right here where we're fetching the client ID and secret to get that opaque reference. The second one is actually something that we can deny at runtime to components. So the really cool bit about this is you can write an API where people are actually able to access secrets, manipulate data that may have a secret in it, but it can never reveal that secret in memory. That in combination with the pluggable model of our secrets backend, which lets you extend it, lets you write a, a different paradigm of applications with WebAssembly that you just truly cannot do with different applications, with, with Docker, with, with Go. I mean, you could probably do something with Go, but with containerized applications today. So this is really awesome. I have a couple things just to show you, just to prove the secrets uh, bit is truly working and fine. You can see that I'm just printing out this opaque. It's just kind of like a number, like a pointer reference. So I've I printed out the secret, no problem. If we go take a look at my secret as it went over the wire, it's this big gobbledygook uh, blob of encrypted bytes, which is great. And so, you know, that's the name of it, but it's not the real value. So this secrets implementation is one of the things that I, I am personally most proud of that we did in WebAssembly or in Wasm Cloud over the last year because of how robust the implementation is and, and what you can do with applications with it. So I'm taking that away across the whole talk. Wasm Cloud has a very powerful multi-tiered security model for its platform. 
in this pluggable security, you don't have to compromise on the flexibility or how robust the implementation can be. Um, if you are running a platform, th this is a, a wonderful way to kind of extend your core capabilities without uh, changing the runtime itself. So uh, looking forward, looks like uh, I'm, I'm a little bit early. Looking forward, I think there's a couple of things that I'd love to do to improve this implementation. The signing, the way that we prove that a component should be able to access a secret is done using NATS ed25519 in keys. This is great, it's verifiable offline. It's something that um, is very secure. But I actually think it would be great to implement this workload identity using this mo the Spiffy model, the Spiffy standard. This is something that we could really do to level up our platform. I think that something that we should look forward to as well is you notice that I was using the TinyGo toolchain to compile to WASIP2. I think that it would be great, and, and I'm really looking forward to the continued support in big Go, as you, as you could say. The Golang toolchain just to compile right there. And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't use TinyGo or that we would use one or the other, but just having the flexibility is great. And then I didn't actually take a look at the policy engine. You know, I led with that, but uh, using the pluggable policy as WebAssembly components would actually be a really cool way to kind of dog food this WASM thing instead of just using a pluggable API. So uh, I think with that, a uh, whole lot of demos, a whole lot of different layers of the security model. Um, I would love for you all to get involved with the, uh, with the Wasm Cloud project. We've, been, uh, we've had so much growth over the last six months with our contributors. So please come uh, get started, try the quick start, take a look at the security model, um, check out our GitHub and you know, all the core code obviously is in the open source and uh, come join us on Slack. We, we have our own Wasm Cloud Slack actually, a bunch of different channels. New one is pets, so if you want to cute, see cute dogs and cats and everything, it's your latest source on the internet for dog and cat pictures. Uh, but we're also in the CNCF Slack if you don't want to you know, add another one in there. So uh, thank you all very much. I, I actually have a, you know, we got a couple minutes, so uh, you know, after the applause and everything, uh, happy to answer some questions. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a microphone too. It might be hooked up for the people at home. Uh, you were talking about you know security uh, benefits that we get with Wasm. So uh, just out, just out of curiosity, I was wondering if there's anything that's sort of easy to integrate with CI for validating security, uh, like vulnerabilities in the code bases or uh, like. Traditionally, with Kubernetes, we're scanning Docker images and stuff, uh, and that you know has to scan uh, packages in the in the image for the whole OS. Is this really just as easy as like a Dependabot or something? I mean, yeah, more? yeah, yeah. It, it's a great question, um, and and the nice thing is that this integrates really well into existing tooling for scanning like source code. So like taking a look at the Go mod, you know, the, you can do all the same things that you're doing with scanning source code for for vulnerabilities. But the real key piece about WebAssembly is that there's this whole category of things you don't need to scan anymore because the actual implementations of like the HTTP server, the secrets backend, the connector to Redis are not a part of my application binary. So it would be, it's very important to scan the, like those pluggable, those host plugins, which are actually run as, run as native binaries. You'd scan those just as you do normally. Uh, but the actual application itself, you have this whole like suite of things that you don't have to scan for. I know that that's hard to explain to a security team uh, with with like you know NA. Uh, but does that make sense? To answer your question. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, how would the policy kind of look like when you reference that it would be like uh, its own component? Uh, is it right now, uh, as you mentioned, like OPA, or how how is it done today? Yeah, right now what the, the policy engine looks like is, where is it? What the policy engine looks like is basically just sending some JSON information about the, the, uh, the action that's happening to something that's listening over NATS. So this can just be a normal Go binary. Um, what, uh, what we have in our documentation is an OPA example that just kind of inspects the, the component um, the component capabilities, and then all you send back is like a permitted true or, or false. Um, How would that look like for something like file system access? So um, 
basically, I actually don't have an example on hand, but uh, what that would look like is you would basically just get a JSON blob with this payload here. So this, this it's called a world, but it's all the interfaces that a component would use at runtime. What you would do, uh, what I would recommend is to actually have an allow list of capabilities that you allow. So if you had like simple HTTP microservices that you know aren't gonna access the file, um, you could either deny any file system access or you could have an allow list to say, you know, incoming HTTP is fine, you know, generating a random number is fine. And, and like when I say this, it would just be like looking in a JSON array to make sure like what that capability is. Yeah, finally, just kind of for file system because there's a lot of legacy code that assumes there's a file system. Can you, are those like fine grained enough to do specific folders or can you like have like a, virtual file system with just like three files because a dependency assumes and needs a file even though you rather not have it? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And this is what's actually really powerful about the component have to, having to ask the runtime for everything that it's going to do. By default for Wasm Cloud, we actually do virtualize that file system. We give a blank read-only file system, so there's nothing in there. If you had something that expected for like a file to exist at a certain place, what you would do is, is like at, at runtime when you execute the component, you would mount that virtualized file system, which could be like a local folder, for example, or like, you know, slash temp slash whatever. But you do have complete support to, to virtualize that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. There's also, I, 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 should, I should do one more shout out. There is a tool in the Bytecode Alliance called Wazi Vert, which it's a, it's a tool for virtualizing. Um, uh, I think it can basically do any of these dependencies in the component. So instead of specifying it at, at runtime, you can actually virtualize this file system import and provide that file system as a part of like the application binary. So a very, very powerful tool there. Um, it looks like a lot of these component calls basically have an implicit trust between them. Is there anything around signing or validation of the various different components that you could reach out to? Uh, like, um, uh, could you maybe just... Well, just like, bit, uh, they, you've got the Wasm Cloud secrets uh, there yeah. that you're bringing in. How do I know that I'm talking to the Wasm Cloud secrets component that I think I am? versus someone else injecting into the ecosystem something else? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, this is something that you would control more at the platform level. The, the platform engineer actually has this control to do this fine-grained access. Uh, the way that we do this, uh, in Wasm Cloud, we actually do have an identity system. If you inspect the component, uh, not looking at the Im interface types, we have uh, this signed identity for a specific component. We have it for all of our capabilities as well. So this is actually a part of like, you, uh, we call it linking, but you link these two things together at runtime. And um, that's, that's a method that we know where something is coming from. But I think this is, uh, again, something that Spiffy or Spire would, would, would do a wonderful job at like actually doing the heavy lifting there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, I got the, um, the warning, warning, you're way over time sign in the back. But uh, I'll hang out here for, for a couple of minutes, of course. Please come ask questions, and, and thank you all so much for coming again.